So before we get into today's episode, I just want to give a quick clarification note because you're going to probably notice a very abrupt ending to this episode. And I wanted to give you some clarification around that. Over the last few months, we've noticed that after about an hour's mark, people seem to start tuning out. And today's guest is such an iconic person. We wanted to make sure that we give him his credit. So today's episode is actually a two-parter episode. Episode 1, 369, and episode 2, 370, are both with former British Columbia Premier Bill Vanderzon. So please tune into both episodes, and you will, won't be disappointed because we talk about so much great things. He gives the, his opinions on the state of politics. He talks about his time in uh, provincial politics. He talks about the state of politics today. He also talks about some of the figureheads that are around Trudeau, Pierre, Maxime Bernier. So please tune into both episodes. You won't miss it. So with that, here is episode one, part one of my interview with Premier Bill Vanderson. Welcome to a very special edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. He is the 28th Premier of British Columbia, and I'm going to list off the entire legacy of this man right now. He is the former Minister of Human Resources, former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Transit, former Minister of Education, former Mayor of the City of Surrey, former Alderman of the City of Surrey, Mr. Premier himself, Bill Vanderzom. Bill, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Chris. It's my pleasure. Uh, I'm, used, I'm accustomed to doing things with the media, the big media. I've given up on that. I only trust you and the likes of you now. Well, I'm so honored to, to have you on the show. We have a lot to cover in this episode. I want to talk about your career. I want to get your thoughts on the state of politics today in British Columbia, in across the nation. But I want to start with the same question I've asked every single politician on my show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, it goes back a long ways. I was, uh, I was an immigrant kid at the age of 13 back in 1947 when I came from Holland and settled in Bradner, British Columbia and uh, went to school in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And then after I graduated from high school, well, actually, I graduated from high school with a plan that I wanted to go to the university. I thought I could be a lawyer. Fortunately, I didn't go there. Something intervened. It was just as well. And uh, um, but because my father had a heart attack, my father was a flower bulb salesman, imported flower bulbs from Holland and sold them all across Canada. And uh, when he had a heart attack, I was chosen to be the member of the family that should take over and do the bulb selling. My first trip took me to Winnipeg and beyond. And frankly, it was a little bit thin like we see it today in Winnipeg. There was a lot of snow and very cold. And I said, no, this is not for me. I think I'll go back to BC and do something other. So I came back to British Columbia, sold bulbs here for a time, and then, uh, then took up growing plants and continued to sell and grow plants. Did quite well by it. However, um, I also became known in the community and I was asked to consider running for municipal council. I hadn't done that before. I didn't know what it was about. I wasn't too particular or too, I wasn't too familiar with all the politics and, and the likes. So, but I did run for council. The first time I uh, didn't make it, but I did well. And I was very impressed with the people I met and the attitude of people and what I saw and heard. And I thought I should continue on another time, which I did. 
I was successfully elected the second time and uh, actually became quite popular in part because I paid attention to the people, which is something often missing in politics. I paid attention to what their needs, what their wants. I even visited their home if they had a problem locally. And uh, yeah, I became quite popular and, and the demand came for me to seek a higher office, which I did. I became mayor of Surrey. And actually, I continued on in politics beyond then, because once you're in, it's hard to get out. <laughs> I'll tell you about that separately. But I also became convinced to this day that there's no better politics to get into if you're going to get into politics than the local level. You're right there with the people all of the time. You're not influenced by outside people, outside pressures. You're not influenced necessarily by big politics and party politics because that doesn't exist at the local level. And the people are wonderful. That's what you are working with, the regular folks, the people. So, however, I, uh, being involved locally as mayor, having been quite popular as the mayor, I thought when I was asked that I should step one, go one step further and ran for the Social Credit Party of, Canada, of BC. And it was again successfully elected, but this time in Richmond. They had a candidate in Surrey and Richmond wasn't too far away. Uh, Lillian, my sweetheart, had already started a business in Richmond and I continued on from there and I was elected in Richmond to provincial politics. Well, and I, I'm going to we're going to take a little bit of a detour before we get into provincial politics, because I want to stick on you for a second, because I want to get to know the man behind the legend that is uh, Vander Zom. And that is, was politics in your family? Were you the black sheep of the family who entered politics by themselves? Or do you have a long line of uh, engagement in politics in your family? No, there was no politics in my family. Did you talk about it with your father and too, your mother? They were all too smart to get involved. <laughs> my father, my father and mother were quite supportive, and that helped naturally. The whole family was very supportive, uh, so that pushed me on. What What was the initial drive? Because uh, you, you say you you. You lost the first election you ever ran in, and losing is a hard matter, no matter who you are. And you've 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 had many wins, but that first loss is always the worst one because you always remember that first one. Running in politics, especially at a municipal level, it is that face-to-face -face conversation. In the 60s, when you first ran, was it different than we see now with municipal politics? No, what happened when I first ran municipally is that the Council of Surrey was proposing to turn a, a, what an area that was designated as Future Park into an area that was or could be developed. And I led a very local movement to fight council's suggestion that this could be this park area could be developed and uh, so I had I had a group of people that I worked with they quickly chose me partly because I was in the plant business as the leader of the group so um, I became the leader of it and that was probably the first real motivation to get involved and <laughs> Voting for yourself is a strange, unique opportunity that only a few people have ever gotten the chance to do. When you went into the ballot box that first election, that first election where you saw your name on the ballot, was it a surreal experience? Because this, this would lead to you being on the ballot, not just once, twice, three times, but many times after. So that first time when you went in to actually cast the ballot for yourself, Take me through that moment. Do you still remember that moment? I don't quite remember that. That goes back a long way. <laughs> you're but, talking. You're talking fifty years back or more. 
much more. But it, is it is it for you, for someone who has had a long line in uh, politics, is there a moment when you were first starting out when you said, I've, I enjoy this. I enjoy the connecting with people because you were seen during your tenure as premier and during your tenure as an, as an MLA as a very much a people person. Why did that stick with you so much? You know, I the only thing I wondered over all of these years is what did I do to get into politics? Why am I doing this? Except I kept going back. And, and to this day, I still love people, work with people, meet with people. And sometimes, quite often, maybe too often, they still come to me because they didn't get an answer from the provincial government or the municipal government. They say, Bill, you've been there. Can you help us out? So I still get involved a little bit, but I'm again, I'm getting, I'm not getting old, but I'm getting on. You, you mentioned that Richmond election, that rich, that first time you were elected to the legislature of British Columbia. Um, again, few people have had that opportunity. Why did you choose the social credit? What was it about the social credit that spoke to you as a mayor of Surrey to announce your intentions to run for the social credit? I've never criticized people for being a member of a political movement, a member of a political party, pushing a particular philosophy. That was their right. That was their, that's democracy. So I know no problem with that. But I wasn't sympathetic, particularly, to the more left-wing uh, approach to things, because I, I got into all of this as a youngster growing up, working extremely hard, never seeking government for anything, and not wanting government, not even liking government all that much. And to this day, I don't particularly like government, as a matter really? of fact. I've been around so long, I don't like government at all anymore, especially today. Which we will talk about a little bit later. So you get into politics for a guy who didn't really like politics, but like the personal experience of politics, of engaging with people. What, what kept you around? Because that would be the ultimate question that anyone should ask in that situation is, why am I still here if I'm not enjoying it? So after uh, having decided, well, actually I was, I was mayor when I decided to possibly get involved provincially, but I was out of politics when I was asked to get involved provincially because Lillian and I were together running a business working hard, doing quite well. And uh, when the provincial government called the social credit government at the time, no, wait a minute, I guess, yeah, social credit government at the time. Uh, I was asked to run provincially. I said, no way, I've been there municipally. It was fun. I'm not going anywhere now, this is it. And it was, the election was actually the, or the, selection of a leader now i'm i'm getting advanced i'm getting ahead of myself i was involved with lillian in the business i was being asked to run provincially i said no i don't want any part i don't want any part of that uh, however it went on and i was asked again and again finally i agreed so probably some of your viewers are saying he's an easy touch maybe i was because I did get involved provincially, not enthusiastically to start with, but I grew in enthusiasm as time went on. Again, because I was mixing and, and meeting with people. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. Your, your rise is kind of very uh, apropos because you, you get elected as a MLA 
for, and I just want to make sure I get this right here, in 1975. So this is uh, Bill Bennett's first uh, term as premier. Uh, WAC had just resigned. Bill had won the leadership. So it was a new government. Uh, this was after a three-year uh, period where the NDP were in power. WAC took over, then Bill took over again. And you kind of get brought into cabinet quite early into your tenure as a new MLA, as Minister of Hum uh, just Human Resources. That's correct. Did you want a cabinet position when you, like you say you didn't want to become an MLA, but you you had the touch and they, they, they wore you down to become a, an MLA. Was it a, con, a hard convince to get you to serve in cabinet or when the premier asks you to do something, do you say yes? Yeah, when the premier asked me to do something, I always did <laughs> say yes. And I went through this a number of times with Premier Bill Bennett. We got along fine, but I never said no to the premier uh, because I was there to serve the people, but to serve the people under his command, so to speak. So no, they, they had, he had no problem getting me to accept. Uh, and frankly, I, I kind of like challenges. I want to do the things that are probably most difficult to do. So I pick up on the challenges. And when he said human resources, that was the most unlikely position I thought might have been picked for me, but he picked it for me. It was his choice. I took it. What was Bill Bennett like as a, like everyone knows Bill Bennett as the figurehead of the social credit party in the seventies and eighties when Bill Davis in Ontario was taking over. Uh, but what was he like as a person, like inter interacting with him, like very few people were able to see the inner workings of Bill Ben. And we'll talk about you in here a few seconds, but what was it like to work underneath him? I think he was, uh, he was efficient. I think he was likable, very nice guy, easy to work with. I could sit down with him or he with me and we could discuss things amicably. No, I thought he was a great guy. And I think so to this day. Was he a no longer with us, but. Unfortunately, was he a hands-on premier? Did he let you take control of the, of the portfolio that you had or the portfolios that you did have under his government? Or was he, because we see different uh, leadership styles federally with Stephen Harper, Justin Trudeau, but was Bill Bennett a hands-on, hands-off premier? Uh, hands off. He basically gave me a relatively free reign. And uh, there were times when he should have called me in and he didn't. But I guess he trusted me as I trusted him. We got along well. You, you, you hold three portfolios under your time as, as a cabinet minister. As I said, human resources, municipal affairs and transit. It is a joint uh, uh, cabinet position and then education. Which one was your favorite? Which one did you enjoy the most? Because I'm assuming as former mayor alderman, you would say municipal affairs and transit, but I can imagine because we have to remember BC is a weird province because the issues in Vancouver municipally are not the same issues up in Dawson Creek. So Definitely as a municipal not. affairs, you are dealing with a lot of different opinions on how to deal with municipal affairs. Was that the challenge, most challenging one? And which one was your favorite? My favorite, human resources. Really? Why is that? that? That, okay, let's talk about that. Why was that your favorite? In part because for me, it was most challenging. Oh, okay. We, we came in after the NDP. The NDP had um, been very liberal with the human resources portfolio. There were more people on welfare during that time with the NDP than what we had seen in previous years or ever. And uh, I, I wasn't against people on welfare, but I saw a lot of young people particularly that might have been working that said, no, I'll go for welfare type of thing. We see some of it now only much more so and much, uh, much more damaging, I think. But then at the time, there were a lot of people, uh, the numbers on welfare were very high. So when I was, uh, when I was selected um, I, as the premier, 
as sorry, as the Minister of Human Resources, I saw certain challenges that I thought would be very rewarding if I could achieve them. Because if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've tried to do as much research on you as possible, but without doing too much, because I like to learn about the, from you. Welfare was a municipal issue when you were alderman and mayor of Surrey. So the issue of welfare was being dealt with on a municipal level. Did you want to change that when you became premier or when you became minister of uh, human resources? I did. I did want to change that. And uh, it was funded provincially, of course, but still. Uh, and, and I think the words came down from Victoria as to what municipalities could or could not do. And that was very frustrating. I know as the mayor, I often had to face that. But the most memorable, I guess, for people uh, thinking back about my time in human resources was that the first thing I, I said to the media when asked, what can they expect from you, Mr. Minister? was look, I'll do the best I can for people in need, particularly for handy people that are handicapped or suffer some way by which they can't do all the things they would like to do for themselves, I'm there to help. If, however, a person young and capable and able refuses to pick up the shovel instead of collecting the welfare, I'll give them a shovel. And that stayed with me for the rest of my life. To this day, people still tell me, Bill, I like your shovel statement. So it did go, it's, I wore it, it stayed with me, but it wasn't all negative. Did you take a lot, because as a more traditional conservative party, the social credits, um, did you sort of see that role of human resources as a, lightning rod for the left, the liberals and the NDP, because I can imagine you would have been the attack of a lot of different uh, uh, question period moments when you have, a, when you say something like, I will give them a shovel. And I'm assuming the NDP or the liberals might disagree with you and say, everyone has the right to do what they need to anyway. Was was the opposition effective in attacking you when you were human resources or addressing issues that you thought, why are you even talking about this? People often ask me, Bill, what do you think of politics today in Canada? And what do you think of, part, of party politics today in Canada? And I say, you know, the, the thing that bothers me most about party politics in Canada is that I can't tell the difference between the NDP and the Liberals and the Conservatives. They're all about the same. Wow. And that was so for a long time. They, they might do things a little differently, but the end product is not all too different. So that was my criticism. So getting publicity over the shovel statement or anything I did in the Minister of, Ministry of Human Resources, I didn't consider it to be a negative. I thought it really helped to set us apart from the NDP and people could choose. They could go back and pick the NDP or they might accept what I was promoting or had been a part of. And that's what I want in my party politics even today. I wanna to know there's a difference between one and the other. So I have a clear choice and let people choose as they may, but they should have a clear choice. As a cabinet minister working in Victoria in the legislature, um, it's hard, especially in portfolios like education, municipal affairs, and human resources, because you will have to be across the province. You will have to crisscross the province. How do you stick true to being a constituents worker during this time, a constituents MLA, while also being a cabinet minister? Because as someone, as you've said beforehand, who enjoys that interaction with people, I'm assuming you don't want to lose your interaction with the people who have elected you. So how do you, how did you, how did you balance being a cabinet minister against being a constituents MLA as well? I, I stayed in my constituency office as often as I could. I, uh, I had regular days when people could 
call in or come in and see me as a constituency member. Um, so I kept a reasonably good contact, but I was getting a lot of publicity even through the local media for what I did as a minister. So it didn't hurt. So you were always in the in the news, even though you might not be in the riding. <laughs> and when I went to my constituency, it wasn't only the supporters that came to see me. There might have often been people protesting for what I had said or done or what they thought me to be. And that's fair game. You, you as we, we talked about your most challenging human resources, but I want to also talk about your other two portfolios as well, and that's municipal affairs and transit and education. We'll start with municipal affairs. What was the big issue in municipal politics in the early 80s and the late 70s that you had to deal with on yourself? What would you say was the biggest issue that you had to deal with? Well, the biggest issue uh, for me was to change the uh, legislation and the rules regarding development. It was very costly, very difficult for people to develop. And uh, already then people were talking about rising housing prices and the likes of that. So I, I tried to introduce legislation that would make the process more open, more available for people to consider and look at and criticize if need be, but at the same time, more realistic, and particularly for people, small or large, that were looking to develop in BC. And again, you hit the nail on the head a little earlier. It's different from Vancouver to Dawson Creek, Fort St. John, or any of those places further north. But then again, uh, I was trying to cover all of that too by giving certain powers and, and opportunities to one area that might not exist in an area depending on what their needs. So it um, that was my biggest challenge. However, in the end, my most successful in, uh, involvement in that ministry was introducing the SkyTrain transit because the uh, city of Vancouver had been talking about transit for so long, but there was so much bureaucracy, so much red tape, it never came to be. They kept talking about it. So they came to me when I was the minister and said, would you consider this? And they had a proposal to run a tram down Kingsway and right from downtown Vancouver through the heaviest parts of BC, of, of Vancouver and greater Vancouver, but on, on, on the ground level. Yeah. I said, you know what? If, you, if you're going to run a train across Kingsway, I'm just picking a street, but it's a main street yep. and it solves the whole, serves the whole region. If you uh, keep running a train across Kingsway, you may be solving one transit problem, but you're, you're creating another transit problem or transportation problem. So I, um, I searched for an option, an option. So when the city came to me and said, this is what we want, I said, sorry, I can't vote for that. That if is we, that is a we that is a very bold statement to say to a city, especially Vancouver, very large city, very large uh, uh, MLAs elected there, to say I can't vote for a solution that you have come up with. Um, I can imagine your uh, Vancouver social credit MLAs who were in uh, your caucus with you were not too happy with you potentially canceling a train that their council wants. <laughs> but we weren't only dealing with Vancouver, of course. We were dealing with Burnaby, with New Westminster, with Surrey. We were dealing with Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. All of the outlying areas were part of the region that was being served by this transit proposal, regardless of whether we went with the Vancouver choice or my choice. And my choice at the time was probably, at least as I saw it, more popular and, and more defensible than 
the Vancouver choice. True. Vancouver at the time, already then, basically uh, were of, uh, of a, an attitude that if we just do away with cars, we're okay. So they weren't concerned as much as I was about crossings busy on busy streets, etc. So I didn't have too much a problem selling it to my colleagues, even those that were elected in Vancouver, they saw it as a common sense approach. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You spoke about housing and I want to talk about it for a second because it's getting a lot of play right now in the national media because of uh, the increased sky of the increased prices in housing in Vancouver. How do we fix the pricing market in Vancouver, the housing market in Vancouver, where a single dwelling house is now million, two million, three million dollars out of reach for anyone who is looking to get it? It's not an easy one. However, obviously what's been done or what they're doing isn't working. That's obvious. And the way you tend to solve problems when something becomes too expensive is to make enough of it available and to uh, make, it, make it so that availability becomes uh, easier in, in part because of changes to how you encourage development if you make enough of it develop and enough available the price will come down the price does not come down when it becomes more scarce or more difficult to get to i agree and the only thing that we can do right now is build baby build as much as i don't like saying those words but but build it and they will go down that's all i can say um well of course the government's Ottawa particularly, but not only Ottawa, but particularly Ottawa, is encouraging more people, regardless of uh, where they're from, what their circumstances, they're encouraging more people to come. And, and um, that, that's fine, except you have to pay for that somehow. And you have to put them somewhere. And if, you, you if they all buy houses... Somewhere. You have to provide for them initially. And it's, it's okay. I, I went shopping with Lillian yesterday a little while next door here. There's a shopping center not too far from where I live. And um, I mentioned to Lillian, I said, you know, look at the whole shopping center, regardless of whether you go into a restaurant, a store or whatever, it's East Indian people that are taking the role of doing the work in the shopping centers. There's a, there's a shortage of labor in Canada. It's so in BC, it's probably so in Alberta and elsewhere. It's even so in the US, a shortage of labor, not because there isn't enough work to be done. I can find tons of work even where I live here, not a shortage of work to be done, but government has made it too easy not to work, particularly our liberal government in Ottawa this time, when they made so much money available to people during the pandemic that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people not working simply because they don't want to work. Yeah. I know them. I know them. I see them often. Um, your last portfolio before uh, we, we sort of go into your premiership is education. Um, being a mayor, you must have enjoyed uh, municipal affairs a little bit because you got to deal with some big issues. But then you get tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, Bill, we're moving you to education. <laughs> What's your first thought there? <laughs> How can that be? It's impossible. <laughs> Why would they pick me for education? So uh, the premier soon made me aware. He said, Bill, we've overspent so much in the educational system. 
and we're not getting the results. The spending is going up. There's more of it than we ever have had previously. And the results are not all that much, if any, better. So I expect you to tackle that and do whatever it takes to succeed. So basically, my job was to go in and, um, yeah, make, can, it less, I, make it less expensive, but more efficient, not easy uh, in the uh, educational system. It's particularly, uh, and yet again, this is education is one of those weird portfolios where you may think it's a non-portfolio, but the moment you change something, the moment you slash a dollar somewhere, parents get upset because how are you taking money out of my child's education and putting it towards something else? We need bigger, we need less classrooms, we need more classrooms, less sizes, more teachers. So it is a challenge for someone to say, go in and sort of be a bull in the china shop and try to get the budget down. So that must have been a fun task. <laughs> it was. I wasn't there that long, so that may tell you something. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> When an election came near, I was sent to someplace else. No, I know. Actually, they were very good with me. And not the teacher so much, although I think a lot of teachers were supportive of me as well. I mean, it's like every, every other thing you get involved with. Some people will applaud you for it. Others will condemn you for it. And uh, I went to a, a school at big school board, uh, not school board, school teacher meeting, union meeting. It was a hall in Vancouver. There must have been a thousand teachers there. Wow. And I walked in and the first thing they started was to sing. Hello, Bill, it's been good to know you. Hi, Bill, it's been good to know you. Hi. And it, it went on and on. Basically, it, it wasn't a complimentary little song. It went on and on for a time, but I just stood, smiled and let them sing. And eventually they allowed me to speak. And I think a lot of them listened. Yeah, it's, it's, um, we tend to, we, I think we too often forget that um, with all of these bodies, be it teachers, be it transit workers, be it social workers, be it, be it, uh, yeah, whatever. You get a lot of people if they're if they're dealt with reasonably and told as to why it is you're doing it and what it is you're doing, and you don't make promises, but you make suggestions as to what could be and how they might be involved with it. People are reasonable for the most part. They we tend to see the unreasonable ones, but for the most part, people are reasonable if they're approached reasonably and presented the information. So I mean, but a prime example, I know you may want to ask about that, but a prime example is the truckers going to Ottawa. If the prime minister had gone out and talked to those folks, spoke to them reasonably and explained to them what it is was being done and why, they may not have agreed, but it would have been a different scenario from what it is today. So, okay, you are the very first first minister I've had on the show in a very long time. I had former Prime Minister Kim Campbell, but this was way before the issues of uh, the trucker convoy happened. So we'll, we'll pause your life story here for a second. I want to follow up with this. I, I understand that you are correct. If Justin Trudeau would have, Prime Minister Trudeau would have walked out and had a conversation, it might have alleviated some issues. My concern is, though, when you have protesters on your front door, which is front door Parliament Hill, who are calling for the overthrow of your government, calling for the death of you, calling for you to be removed from office, do you still, as a first minister, have the obligation to go talk to them? So in your situation, when you were premier, I'm assuming you had protesters because that's what politics is, is protests. Would you go out and have a conversation with someone if they were calling F you, F Trudeau, this, that, or the other? Or do you take the higher ground and go out and still have that conversation, even with what they're saying? Absolutely. You know, when I was the Minister of Human Resources and told people to pick up a shovel or I'd give them a shovel, 
one weekend, I was the minister. I went home to the business that Lillian was taking care of and doing a super job at with the kids. They were all involved. It was a garden center. We had piles of soil and we were selling soil as well as plants. And suddenly a big delegation of people appeared on the parking lot to protest me because they knew that I might be there that particular weekend. How they found out, it didn't matter, but they were there. So they started to protest. I walked out and I had three shovels in my hand. And I said, look, I have more shovels. If you just go there and shovel soil, I'll pay you, no problem. And if that somehow leads you to finding another job and I can help in the process, I'll do that. You know what, the protest was soon over. Not too many picked up the shovel, but the message got out. So it, yeah, people can be against you. They can be very much against you, but if you approach them reasonably, it works. And Trudeau could have done it very differently. I think, I don't like criticizing other people, but I think he, he could have done it very differently and should have done it very differently because what he ended up doing in the end by putting people in jail or seizing their bank accounts He's going to wear that forevermore. As a matter of fact, it'll defeat him for sure. Which we will talk about in a few minutes, but I want to talk about your premiership. So 1983, Bill Bennett runs his last election as premier of British Columbia. Did you know that that was going to be his last election or did he make indications to cabinet that this is it one more and i'm done and then start getting your horses lined up because there will be a leadership race or when did you find out or when did cabinet find out and caucus find out that bill was stepping down i don't know exactly when cabinet found out but i did because i was not in cabinet at the time yeah. i had gone away from provincial politics to get back to Lillian and the business. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but I knew that the popularity of the party was sinking pretty rapidly. And um, I didn't quit because of that, but it was bound to happen because BC is the type of province where parties tend to take turns. <laughs> It's not like Alberta, where you might have one political party going on forevermore, almost evermore. So the, um, um, I knew that something was going to happen. And when Bill said he was stepping down, I realized, first of all, he had been there a long time in the way I saw it. And I, uh, I thought, you know what? I don't blame the guy. It's time. He should enjoy life, do things because all the good things he's doing now will be forgotten in 10 or 15 years anyway. So he should enjoy life. So that was my attitude to begin with. But I also realized that uh, he, also, he's, he was a practical guy and he could see that maybe a change would give the party another change, another chance. Thanks so much for tuning in. Again, I do apologize for the abrupt ending there. Uh, the remaining 45 minutes of the interview are going to be aired tomorrow. So if you want, be sure to tune in for that one.